Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, an optometrist, you know, with eye problems, and I was very alternative in my work. And uh, one of the things that I uh, um, really enjoyed doing with people was, was a kind of uh, learning process uh, that uses a trampoline to uh, train people who uh, have learning problems, uh, who are, um, have head injuries, uh, and people who are good athletes and musicians. And, and uh, Rebecca had, Ms. Penny's had a, an eye problem, came to, to our working, and uh, she saw the way I work with the trampoline. And, uh, she said, you know, this would be really, really good uh, as part of the uh, piano program that she was uh, teaching uh, during the summers in Aqua. And uh, so she invited me to come and to, to lecture. I just had lunch. Oh. <laughs> Um, so I did. I came to uh, Chautauqua and I gave a little lecture like this, and then uh, saw each of the students like we do here, and uh, I became a fixture in, in the program. We became uh, partners, and uh, so that's how I got here. That's my background. So I'll say a little bit about the trampoline work. Um, there was an optometrist named Pepper, Robert Pepper. And he invented this approach. And uh, the thing about the trampoline uh, that relates it to music is that um, both of them have to do with not only doing the right thing, but doing the right thing at the right time. So with the trampoline, um, there's different kinds of, uh, of uh, kind of reading tasks, cognitive tasks, where you're given a set of instructions and you have to keep the instructions in your head uh, and then proceed to go through a sequence of, uh, of things. For example, a sentence. The sentence that I was using today in, in the teaching I did was uh, the girls, um, this girl went home. It was uh, four words, four letter words. And, uh, and, they, and people had to bounce on the trampoline and, and read and spell the sentence as they jumped. And then pretty soon they had to spell the sentence, but when they got to a vowel, and they had to clap their hands on the vowels. So they're, they're learning how to, to, to uh, read, uh, to do the sentence backwards, to uh, count the spaces, but spell their name on the vowels. And so this whole variety of uh, more and more difficult uh, tasks to do uh, that require your brain being really present, uh, things working, well in, in the way you're uh, handling it, uh, that your motivation is still there, and there's uh, just a whole series of uh, activities that one can do on, on using that trampoline. And again, it's like doing music, because there's more and more difficult types of tasks that you can do, just like there's some phrases that are fairly easy and other ones that are look like they're impossible when you first start using them. Um, I don't, I'm not here to uh, teach people to become the best pianist in the world. I'm not a pianist. Uh, but I think it's, I think that one of my sense of my goal is to make you a better coach for yourself when you're alone in the music, in, the, in your practice room learning a new piece of music. And most of us don't look at ourselves in terms of some of the aspects of learning that I uh, talk about. And which I'll cover today. Um, other kinds of charts that, that uh, one can use, I, you probably can't see this, but it's a it's dog, it, it's, um, it's uh, pigs and ducks. And so for a child who doesn't know how to read yet, I would have them jumping on the trampoline, and they have to say in, uh, in, in, in pig talk, oink. That's how we say oink, what a pig says. And what Doc says is quiet. So the child may not know how to, how to uh, read yet, but we can use this chart 
where they have to go through and they, uh, so it's oink, quack, oink, quack, oink, quack, 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 and so forth. Um, okay, so, so if you're dealing with a young child that has problems, uh, maybe four years old, and you start with this chart, they love the chart, uh, they love to say oink, quack, and uh, for them to go the, through this whole chart, which has uh, uh, probably 25 or 30 different uh, characters that they have to uh, say or oh, quack about, <clears throat> you can really extend their attention span. So one of the things they have been working on here is attention. And you know, as, as somebody uh, who's a musician at your level, you have to pay attention. You have to have really good attention. And you have to be able, if you're going to really be effective, uh, you have to be able to control your attention. You have to be able to maintain it. You have to be able to safeguard when your brain begins to keep, become a little confused uh, and your motivation begins to drop. You have to recognize that you're not as smart as you were a few minutes ago before you made a mistake. You make a mistake and suddenly all of your negative self-opinions start coming up. I'll never learn this. I'm not good enough. Why am I doing this in the first place? and you begin to really hate yourself, and you begin to get mad at the piano, and so forth. So at that point, if you don't recognize that your brain has fallen from a certain level of attention and togetherness, organization, to one that's below that, and you start making mistakes that you weren't making five minutes ago, then nobody's going to say, if there were a coach with you, the coach would say, uh, I think it's time for us to take a break, or let's try to do some other task. Uh, to kind of bring your brain back up to the level that it was before. Uh, but it, when you're alone, you may not even know that you're supposed to pay attention to how well your brain is working. You may be going on, you have 15, 20 minutes of good uh, practice, and uh, suddenly something happens to you and you get the wrong thought in your head. You have a kind of negative reflex, and you lose your ability to pay attention. And if you don't notice that your brain has gone through that shift where you're less organized or less motivated because of something that happened, uh, then you're going to lose time. You're going you're to really dislike practicing. Every week you go back and you do your uh, lesson and then you go home and you practice or you go to, to your practice room and, you're, and you leave hating it. You slam the door uh, because you got too frustrated. So one of the things you have to think about is how do you adjust yourself for the task that you're attempting to do? So if you are, uh, so there's a kind of thing, what I call this work is stress point learning. Okay? And the stress point refers to a level of challenge. So this is the challenge. And this is how smart you are right there. Okay? How smart we are, how together we are changes throughout the day. It changes, it can change in a flash, just a second, when something happens. And if you watch uh, uh, something like tennis, you see the tennis player make a mistake they didn't think they should make, or the referee calls the ball out when it was really in, and they kind of fall apart for two or three times, and then they're able to recover from that. And so we have that same kind of situation when we're trying to learn something that's a stretch, that's hard for us, okay? And, uh, and so, <clears throat> if, if, this is, um, if this is how, how, if this is how smart I am, and this is the challenge, then it's real easy for us, okay? We're much smarter than the challenge that we've chosen for ourselves. And so people say, well, I, uh, somebody that I'm looking say, this person's really great, they look like a million dollars, and, uh, but then you make it a little bit harder, and a little bit harder, and at some point, you reach the point where you're just a little bit, uh, the demand of the task is a little bit uh, below the uh, level of organization in your brain. And so, but it's not so far above that you can't succeed at it. In other words, uh, there's a range just above what you can do easily and where the challenge is the most important, the stress point challenge. Okay, you can do it, but probably it'll take you more than 
one or two or three or four or five different tries to do it, that you're going to make a mistake there. And if you let that mistake, like you're learning a, a phrase, and you make a mistake in it, and you go, oh, I shouldn't have made that mistake. Well, then you're going to lose your motivation. Your mind is going to start wandering. And what happens is, this is how smart you work. This is the bad demand. You make a couple of mistakes, and it capsizes you. It sinks your motivation, and suddenly your brain is organized at this, at this level. Instead of being where it was, it falls down. And if you don't notice that it's doing that, then you're going to be fighting up against, you're going to be trying to do something that's way above your level. You're not at the stress point anymore. And the more you try, the worse you do. And pretty soon you just have this downward spiral, and you waste a half hour of your practice time or even more. And you leave thinking, I'm never going to do this again. And you slam the door, and sure enough, the next week, the next day, you come back in, and you start the same process all over again. And you don't even notice that that's your process, that that's what happens to you. When I'm working with somebody on the track lane, I can see what their stress point behaviors are, the negative behaviors around when the challenge starts becoming a little bit more than their actual uh, um, ability at that point. Okay? It's, it's doable in the stress point zone, but if it's too difficult, you're just going to be kicking yourself uh, across the, the room. You're not going to be able to succeed at it, and you'll get worse and worse, and you won't be able to succeed even at something that used to be easy. So it's really important, and most of the time we don't notice that. We just notice that we're not very happy. Uh, and when, when, you're, when you're learning something that's just a little bit, when you really have to, 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 to reorganize your brain, it's not fun. I mean, it's a lot of work to do that. Nobody thinks it's fun. But if you don't do that, and you just keep practicing things that are easier for you, then you may do great on that, but you're not actually improving. You know, what you want to do, at all levels of life, but certainly at this stage, is to become better and better and better so that you should fulfill more and more of your potential. And so you want to uh, always be finding your stress point and using that as a guide to uh, being able to go to do something that's a little bit harder than, than, than what you're used to. And, that, and you just kind of piggyback on that. Pretty soon you're doing stuff that's really, really, really hard. So you want to be able to recover when your brain starts to uh, disintegrate or fall apart and you start going down. You, go, you want to notice that as early as you can in the process because then you can save yourself and come back up to what it was. And that's the way you save yourself uh, or recover is when you first notice that instead of keeping the demand of the task way up here, it used to be right at the stress point, and now you've sunk down a little bit you noticed it, because I told you to notice it, or maybe you do anyway, okay? So what's the answer? The answer is to, to make the task that you're doing easier, to simplify the task. You simplify the task, and then you can do it, you start looking good, and you start looking good, and pretty soon, uh, and so you're rewarded because you're being successful. And that success motivates you, and pretty soon you're bringing yourself back up to the original level or even better. Okay, so that's a really important strategy for uh, being able to coach yourself in a better way and do what a coach or, or a teacher, but, but generally when you're learning a new piece of music, what we tend to do is to think, we kind of get an idea of how everybody does it. This is the way it's done. We have no way of checking, we don't ask anybody about it. We just make an assumption and then we try to do it that way, which may or may not be the best way for you. So, being a better coach for yourself, or you're going to ask the teachers, I'm trying to learn this piece, can you give me some help uh, in learning how to do it? Because I don't have a coach for it. Nobody comes in and watches me and says, this would be a better way to proceed. Okay, so part of it is this sense of the stress point, of recognizing when your brain is not working at the same level it was two minutes ago, and what can you do about it? I can play the piece slower, I can play it with uh, a more simplified uh, version of it, so you don't have to play all the uh, extra notes, you're just playing the chords. Something that allows you to keep practicing without uh, losing ground, because it's hard. So it's very hard 
If you don't do that, if you don't constantly be challenging yourself at a level, not too difficult, but a level above the level that you're uh, working at, that, you're, that you're, you do have to add something to the way your brain is working, then you're going to start getting better. You're going to actually make improvement and improvement and improvement. But if you spend 30 years playing the same piece of music, so that it just is, I mean, we, we think that the end point is to be able to do it automatically. Okay, so at the beginning it takes a lot of effort, and then you learn a piece, and then pretty soon you can do it with automaticity, we call it. Uh, and we think that's it. That's what we're not supposed to do, but you've got to go beyond that. You've got to say, okay, I can do that. So there's five questions that you have to ask yourself, that it would be good if you ask yourself. <clears throat> when you know, how do you know when you're finished learning something? Well, the first question is, can I do it? So you've been practicing for two weeks and finally you can get through the piece of music, you can play all the notes at the right time, uh, and you can do it, and that's the answer to the first question. And some people go, oh great, now I got it. But you're selling yourself short. Okay? So the next question has to be asked. And that, that question is, can I do it well? Because there's a difference between playing the notes at the right time uh, and the right notes, but to play it in a way that sounds like beautiful music uh, is another question. So can I play it well? And say, great, now I've got it, I can go learn something else. No, 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 there's more questions. So the next question is, can I do it well every time I try it? Can I do it well three times in a row without making a mistake? Oh, now I got it, but no, it doesn't work out that way because there's another question, and that question is, can I accept change? What does that mean? If you play the same piano in the same way, and you can do it well three times in a row, what happens when you go to your teacher, and suddenly something you can play, you're not able to play because why? The feeling of the piano is different. The echoes in the room are different. And so you're stuck in one way of doing it, and as soon as something else happens, like in playing in a hall instead of in your, in your practice room, uh, you haven't accepted change. You haven't learned how to do it well every time and play it differently. Okay, that's another really important point that's going to take you to places in your, in your learning and your overall progress in a, in a, in a much better direction. Uh, than stopping at question number one or question number two. Question, the next question, the fifth question is, can I not only accept change, well, can I play it louder, can I do, can I play it with more um, um, variation, can I play it faster or slower, can I play it, Miss Penny used to teach a course called uh, The Voice of the Piano, where she was able, in the way that she uh, touched keys, she can make a, uh, a, a Yamaha sound like a Steinway. And she taught people how to do that. So you can say, OK, uh, can I accept change? Can I listen to somebody playing the same piece and do what they do? Can I make it sound you know, like Heifetz? Not Heifetz, but I can't kind of make it sound like Horowitz. I mean, you can play around so that you have some, some uh, uh, options. Because when you go in to play a concert somewhere, you have, you're at the mercy of that piano. And if you just know how to play your piano in the same way, and you don't go into these higher levels, uh, then you're, you're going to be much uh, worse situation, and you won't be able to adapt yourself to the sounds and the echoes of the room and the uh, idiosyncrasies of the piano. So it's really important to, to go those extra steps, more than just competent but actually really excel at it, where you can really play it in a way that you're, you're kind of free and you can get thoughts and have those expressed uh, in, in how you're playing. Uh, but that's really hard because each of those questions requires a much stronger uh, will, willpower to stay in doing it. You know, it's much harder to play something well three times in a row than it is to play it once in a row. Um, once in a row. Once. <laughs> so um, anyway, these are some of the ideas. Um, another one is I uh, talked about recovery. So recovery in one sense is if you start to fall, 
your attention starts to fall, the sooner you notice that your attention is falling, the easier it is, or the more effective you'll be at bringing your brain back. Okay. And if, you, if you're trying and it's not you know, going well and it keeps getting worse anyway, then you have to take other steps, which is to go get a drink of water, or to uh, just breathe and relax and meditate for a few minutes, you know, something like that. So you're the coach, you're the boss in that situation, and you want to take yourself uh, as far as you can in terms of practicing in a way that uh, actually challenges your best to make you get even better, because all of us are not what we could be, and um, and that's that's what it is. But if you just say, well, uh, yeah, I played it. That's it, uh, and you're not going to be progressing. You're going to be wasting your practice time, and you're going to fall behind what you could be doing. Um, recently, I, I started reading a book. It's called Peak, P-E-A-K. -E and let me see if I can get the guy's name. Uh, Yes, it's called Peak, and uh, this guy, there's two people that are authors. One is Robert Poole, the OOL, and uh, the other one is Anders Ericsson. And they're both kind of um, uh, psychology uh, people, neurology people, and they're looking at everything from brain function by using some of these modern techniques to say, you know, who's got, uh, um, what, what kind of pianist has who's really excelling, do they have different brain than other people uh, that, that aren't up at that level. For, for example, if, if uh, young children start playing a musical instrument at a young age, they grow more uh, white brain matter, which has to do with these really fast networks that are in the brain. Uh, those networks grow and get stronger and faster uh, as you're developing. Uh, that's one thing that comes out in that book. So, so the book is about peak, which means reaching your peak levels of performance. And, and the theory is, or the observation that they're uh, uh, talking about is this idea of the stress point, even though they don't use that term, but challenging yourself at higher and higher levels, not too high, not too low, but right at the right level of the stress point. And, uh, and they call it purposeful practice. Because what happens to a lot of us, I'm sure it happens to you to some extent, is you go in and you're kind of half doing it. You're playing it, you can play it through, it's kind of automatic, but you're not challenging yourself. You're not doing it with purpose. You're not coming up with strategies to improve you when you, when you reach a point where you're trying to learn something uh, that's really difficult. Uh, that's where a teacher comes in. It's like a golf, when somebody wants to be a golfer and they're learning how to, to, to hit the ball right, the reason they get a coach is just to look at the person to say, this is what you're doing, you should do this when you're trying to hit the ball with that, with that club. So that's what, part of what a teacher does, is they, they observe what you're doing, they've been through it before, they know how to challenge themselves, and they begin to impart hints to you and try to get you to understand ways of getting yourself to the point where you're actually making progress. Uh, another term they use in that book is called deliberate practice, where you're actually practicing with a purpose instead of just kind of going through the motions and just kind of resting on what you've already learned. You've got to keep challenging yourself at as high a level as you're capable of doing and notice when you've chosen something that's beyond the stress point so that you can then recover and learn how to recover yourself. So it's, it's a matter of creating uh, strategies that's part of the creativity of becoming the best that you can be. Um, it used to be that they said, well, if you haven't learned how to play uh, a musical instrument by the age of six or something like that, then you're, it's too late. But uh, in the last couple of decades, they've uh, realized that even old people have brain plasticity. It used to be that once you're born and your brain is uh, uh, developed, anytime any nerve dies, that's the end of that nerve. You don't grow new nerves. Well, that's not true. You know, that was the going thought in, in, uh, in science. 
then when they started to get these uh, high-level measuring um, ways of measuring the brain and the chemistry of the brain, they began to say plasticity happens throughout life. And, and so you want to take advantage of that. Uh, so even when you're in your 30s or 40s or maybe even in your 80s or 90s, you, can, you actually still have some, uh, some plasticity. Of course, you have more than when you're very young, uh, but you guys still have a lot of plasticity left. In other words, you can change how you do things. So one of the nice things about the trampoline is by using the trampoline, which you'll all experience. Um, uh, and I, so what, um, the trampoline can make a big change in the way you control your body, the way you use your body. It's, um, um, maybe I should have brought the trampoline down here. There's certain, uh, um, <clears throat> There's certain um, exercises that, that you can do. I did them for about nine people today in the class, in my class, um, where you have to do uh, certain moves that are complex while you're jumping on the trampoline. You have to do it at the time of the trampoline. So you have to keep your timing. And one of those um, more complicated movements uh, might be something like, uh, you're jumping, you have to make, move your hands like this, and not like this, you know, or not like this, which some people do, you have to move them well, you have to keep the rhythm of your movement, and then at the same time, you have to be able to do something like move your legs in, in certain ways, uh, or twist your feet in and out while you're doing this, or twist one side in and out, where you're making a more difficult move, and then the other hand has to be able to do something else. And what does that do? It opens up the pathways between different parts of your brain. And you know, as pianists, you're doing something quite co complex in your body. And uh, a good percentage of you are going to have some places in your body that are not quite free yet. From, we call it um, uh, retain um, developmental um, movement. There's these, these stereotype movements that babies make <clears throat> as they get in their first months of, uh, of life uh, that are what we call stereotypical movements, which are um, we call them primitive uh, movements. So for example, babies at a certain age <clears throat> are, if they're sleeping, they're going to sleep like this. Okay? Head is turned in one direction, the hand that's that they're, that they're looking at or that's in front of them is far away and the hand that they're not looking at is right behind the back of their head. And if they're sleeping and you pull their arms like this, they'll turn their head. It's kind of locked in. It's, it's there. And, uh, and so what happens is that as the baby develops and their body learns how to uh, um, inhibit that movement, because if, if this is, if they're, they call that asymmetrical neck reflex, it's not symmetrical. Uh, if you move their head, they'll move their arms. But you have to learn to grow through that, to mature through that, because if you're uh, only doing this and, and not this, then the kid, the kid takes a piece of food, goes to eat it, and they turn their head. So there are probably 35, maybe more, 50 different reflexes, primitive reflexes, they call them. Um, and we all retain some of them, so we're not quite as free. We don't have as many options as somebody who is playing the violin or playing the, the piano, where you have to do complex different things with the two sides of your body uh, and keep your flow going and keep your attention going and keep you, your ears still engaged and your sense of what's what's of being in touch with God at that point, or whatever. So, um, these are things that I'm trying to teach uh, in the, in the uh, trampoline uh, work, and, in, and that so that you can get a better idea of what some of your needs might be, because nobody's going to point them out to you, and you're not going to notice them. So, um, being able to expose yourself to a situation that reveals what your negative behaviors or, or your limitations are in a way that uh, that then helps you to overcome those, um, those uh, in inhibitions, uh, that's going to put you in a much better place, especially when you can be your own coach.
that says, ah, that's what I'm doing. It's like the golf um, pro that's teaching the learning person says, you know, you've got this foot turned in the wrong direction and you're not holding your club in a way. And so every time you hit the ball, it's going to go over there. You may want to try it this way. And so then you practice that. So you have purposeful practice because you have some kind of goal that you've thought about. You've got some kind of a, of a strategy that you're going to try. It's a big experiment. Listen, I think if I try it this way, what happens? But that's not what happens to most of us. We just have kind of one way that limits us. So being able to understand what I'm talking about today and say, yes, that does sound good to me. Uh, that's a really uh, big contribution that you can make to yourself to be a better coach. Okay? So, uh, so one of the phrases in this book called Peach, uh, uh, called uh, Peach, uh, is <clears throat> a hypothetical piano teacher and a student. So the student had a test the day before, had to play a piece of music, and had a C. And when he came in for his lesson uh, later that day or the next day, he, the teacher says, what do you want to do? He says, well, I want to know why I got a C. And, he's, and so the teacher says, well, uh, did you practice the music? Did you play it all the way through? He said, yeah, well, how many times did you play it? He, oh, maybe a dozen times. And then he um, says, I could play it. And when I came in, and somehow oh, I got a C on it. And so then the teacher says, well, how many times did you play it perfectly? And the student says, I don't know, maybe two or three times. So the teacher, I mean the student, didn't feel that it was his responsibility or her responsibility to know if they made a mistake or not. And so they just keep making the same mistake, don't even notice a mistake, like the golfer that doesn't hold his, his posture right or whatever. Uh, it's your job to know whether you did it right or not. When I'm working with somebody on these complex tasks on the trampoline, I say, you've got to tell me, like if I'm working with a kid, I'll say, did you do that correct? correctly? And they go, I don't know, my mother's supposed to tell me or my teacher. No, no, you have to, otherwise you're not going to get any better if you don't know how you're doing. And so that's this idea of deliberate practice. Or, uh, <clears throat> so you have to get that idea in your head because it's going to put you in a much better uh, situation. So this, this, this piano student didn't know had no idea whether he was doing it perfectly or not. And so you may have to get a tape recorder and listen to it. Or you may have to go back and, I mean, people are learning things wrong. If you learn something wrong, then it takes a lot of work to undo it. And so when you come from, what some people, they, they come, in my sense of it is they come to a place of the music that's really difficult. They don't even look ahead and find out how difficult it is. And they just kind of plow into it, sight reading it and it falls apart, and then they always develop some kind of, a, of, a, of a, an emotional response, fear of that area, and that disturbs their, their uh, playing from then on every time they get to that part of the music, where they've had such a terrible experience. It's embedded somehow in their brain, and, and sometimes they'll make a mistake right before it, uh, that place, or sometimes they do the place, and, they, and then they go, wow, that really worked. And then they make a mistake right there. So um, uh, being able to extend your attention until um, until the real end, instead of saying, "Ah, oh, I'm almost done," and then it falls apart. And some people make a mistake toward the end of every piece. You know, they do that. Another aspect of it is: Do you know when you're ready to begin? Do you want? To, you know, are you ready to do this? How did that feel? You did much better. How did it feel? Did you feel ready when you started? Those kind of questions you ask yourself. So then you say, I really felt ready that time. And how did I get that? I breathed, I relaxed, I thought of the music, and, and, and then when I felt like I was ready, I started. But some people are so anxious and impulsive, they just sit down. I had one student at Chicago in the program there. She would start playing a piece her recital piece, before she even sat down. She would so. I said, we've got to you know, give you some kind of self-control. And so I worked with her 
couple of extra sessions until she could finally sit down, breathe, think about the, the, the emotion of, of the beginning of the piece, get herself talk to her, and then, oh, um, okay, you could, oh, ah, this is how it's going to sound. You can prepare yourself. And uh, so we got to the, that place, and then I had her, um, her recital, and she had to do it, and she came in the next day. I said, how'd it go? And she said, I started playing the piano before I sat down. So it's real hard to change that, but getting that idea of am I ready to go now and not moving until you're ready to go is uh, another kind of hint, another thing that you can look at. So um, recovery. So there's a part of the brain that knows that you're going to make a mistake before you make the mistake. It's called the anterior cingulate cortex. And uh, and it's there, and the brain actually, uh, if you're measuring the, the electrical magnetic uh, kind of changes by putting an electron on the skull, there, there's something that happens <clears throat> that um, the, 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 the measurement goes negative just before you're about to make a mistake. In other words, your brain knows before you make a mistake that you're going to make a mistake. And if you begin to really pay attention to whether or not you made a mistake, like somebody's bouncing on the trampoline, they're spelling a sentence, and they have to clap their hands on the spaces and say, and, and, and say the name of a color on the vowels, you know, something really complicated. Uh, the, the, the rule is you have to be able to tell me whether you did it right or not. If you begin to make a mistake, uh, you have to stop and tell me what the mistake was, and then you have to start at the beginning again. Okay, because it, what a lot of people do is they make a mistake, and then they start from there and go on to the next part, and they make a mistake. So their attention span never really gets any longer. So you go back to the beginning again, and you see if you can make it all the way through without making a mistake. But you've got to notice your mistakes. You've got to be at least that conscious in order to begin to improve yourself. And so what happens is, uh, Tell me when, if you make a mistake, stop and tell me what it was. And the first time they go through the sentence, for example, uh, they get to the end and I said, did you do that correctly? And they, and they will say, I don't know, I, did, I don't know. And I said, well, okay, you did make a mistake, uh, so let's start again. You made a mistake right here. So um, they do it, and this time they say, I think I made a mistake, but I can't remember what it was. And pretty soon they get to the point where they make a mistake and they know what it was, and it's like they're more there. And then the next phase is uh, they start to make a mistake, but they catch themselves, and they almost succeed at not making the mistake. They almost recover from making the mistake. And then, uh, uh, but they don't actually recover. So then, then the next stage is they start to make a mistake. They stop themselves from making a mistake. They succeed at stopping themselves. But then after that, they fall apart. So eventually what happens is they start making a mistake, they correct it, they can go on, and then finally gets, they feel the mistake coming before they start to make it early enough that they actually can recover before they even start making the mistake. I call it pre-covering. And it's a trainable thing. It's part of the plasticity that's possible to train your brain in order to be able to say, to get to let that anterior cingulate cortex uh, get more strength to refer, refer the rest of your brain and your consciousness to the fact I'm losing it, I can recover and not lose it now. So it's possible to do that, but we have to say, one of the deliberate practice mechanisms that I want to use is to recognize as early as possible when I've begun to make a mistake and stop tell myself what it was, make sure that I really understand it, go back to the beginning and go through again. So that you're going to be better and better and better at recovering uh, from even beginning to make the mistake because it's there for you. So what have we got here? Okay, so we're going to play a game because a lot of the time we don't know that we're not really paying attention. 
we think we're paying attention, but we're not really paying attention, and we don't know it. So this game, called the balloon game, is um, Okay, so what we're going to do is, is just, I'm going to give you a sentence, and you're going to be hitting the ball up in the air, uh, and the person that hits it has to say the first letter of the sentence, and then the ball, the balloon's going to go back up in the air, and it feels like there's a little breeze in here from the heating system or whatever, so the brain, the, the balloon might be going always in a certain direction. But you're, you're trying to be nice to the other people because it's a team effort. Because we have people that were not uh, born in the English speaking countries, uh, chose the easiest, most famous uh, sentence to be or not to be. Everybody heard that before? Shakespeare? Okay, so here's the game. The first person hits it and says, T. And the next person who hits it says, oh. And the next person that hits it, it's a space between two words. There's a two, and there's a space between the words, B, E, and there's a space between that, and O, R, okay? <clears throat> when you get to the space, so the first person that hits it says B, uh, uh, T, and the next person says, oh, and the next person hits it, but doesn't say anything, because it's a space, okay? And then the next person has to remember where you are in the sequence. So it sounds, might sound hard, but for a lot of people, so well, that's easy. But you've got to remember where it was. And then, uh, what happens is the balloon comes to you, and you're not quite paying attention. You're in, uh, in right field in the baseball, but the ball doesn't get, at, get hit to the right, and so that person in the right field can go to sleep. Okay? And then all of a sudden they wake up and say, wait, the ball's coming to me. So that's, that's what happens. So the ball's coming to you, and you go, and you can't even know what it is. So, so the idea is that you want to be able to see that. So this is the bowling game. And the uh, first person hits it, and then, it's not going to be me, I'm just going to hit it. Because I'm supposed to be, oh, you're going to go to the What?